come down. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Now, that means something new has been added to That's that. right, Senator. Right. We know yeah. how you like to yeah. make speeches. Yeah, give me a chance. <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't see you come in. I came in promptly at 4 o'clock. We have here about 36 South Dakota farmers, uh, delegates who come all the way, a 3,000 mile trip, Senator, to talk to you about the farm program. And next week, we hope to have twice as many here as you see this time. We, uh, South Dakota has the largest delegation of, the, of all the states so far. Good. Now, before we start, on next week, I want to talk to you about it, because you always come on Tuesday. That's right. And next week, I have to give a Lincoln Day talk on Tuesday night. Give it to us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lincoln Day speech is never without giving some talks to old Abraham Lincoln, of course. So I wondered if we could arrange to meet sometime Wednesday morning. Yes, I think possibly. Could, but uh, Wednesday, Wednesday morning. Well, yes. that, I wonder if that would be all right for Senator Gurney. Thursday morning. Thursday morning. Thursday morning. Thursday morning. All right. Okay, we'll make a note of that. Uh, Thursday morning. We'll try to rearrange the program. Yes, I want to give you time to work on that one. No, no, uh, we've got to get right down to the last fact. We've only got a few minutes left. I just want to say this word, that uh, this group uh, discussed the matter uh, unanimously for the Brennan program because it's the only thing thus far advanced that incorporates the basic fundamental principles advocated by the Farmers Union, namely full parity, 100% of parity, and protection of the family type farm, that unit limitation. That's, uh, I think it's an excellent formula. Now the Department of Agriculture, with all its research and experience and farm legislation has been evolved over the years, certainly the recommendations should merit some consideration. And uh, we hope that you will see fit to give us some support. And, and if we oppose the Brandon plan, Senator, we assume the very grave responsibility of substituting something better. And, and the worst thing that could, be, could happen would be if this Congress adjourns without doing anything. I, that's all I want to say. I'd probably you'd like to hear from three or four of the boys here. Uh, there's, I suppose two-thirds of the counties of the state are represented here today. And we won't have time to hear from very many. Uh, Lawrence, uh, did you want to say a few words, Lawrence? I don't know whether he heard any inspection or not, whether he got here. Did you uh, hear Lawrence? Uh, I don't think so. There's somebody talking down here at the time I came in. Uh, we were thinking about what happened after the last World War. We know that uh, agriculture was plunged into a depression before the rest of society. It went down further and stayed down longer. Uh, we think maybe it's going to happen again. We're scared that it is. That's why we're here. Uh, in 1948, our gross income went down $3 billion. 1949, another three billion or so. Economists tell us it was due for another dip in 1950. Uh, we think that some kind of an agriculture program should be enacted that would prevent this. And we think that the Brandon Plan is the answer. Uh, we, why we like the Brandon Plan, uh, the farmer union is, and farmer union people have never asked for anything but 100% of parity. We don't think other segments of society are entitled to purchase our products for less than the cost of to produce them. And uh, then we've always stood four square for the farm family. Uh, it has a formula in there that sets up limitations to how far the protected price shall go. It has a guarantee or supported price in there. And uh, there's other things I was going to mention. Uh, you can interrupt uh, later, but no. uh, I think the ladies ought to have an inning here. The time is so short. Mrs. Kunze here from Sanborn County. She might want to make some remarks on what parity means for the housewife. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to give you a chance. I'd like to talk about a little bit. Uh, yes. Now, this is from the point of view of the housewife. And I think, uh, surely, the housewife thinks as much of, of the Brandon plan as the farmer does. Now, you notice that top line is the uh, United States average level of living. Uh, giving, going out the end to 100%. Now the second line, I'm going to do this more briefly, is household facilities. Uh, now I consider that parity should include, I mean, the part of parity should be those things like uh, bathrooms and running water, electricity, and uh, some of the other modern conveniences. I think parity, 100% of parity, should include those things. And you'll notice that the farmer has only 30% of the average, while the non-farm has 115%. Uh, the 
on the physicians that part, the most 62% are 111. Now the farmer only uses the services of physicians about half as much according to that. And uh, we'll just take the next one then uh, on in income per capita. Uh, the farmer's income is 63% of 100% while the other is 109. Now uh, the farmer just can't possibly keep the standard of living up on only 63% of the average. Uh, I don't, you can't expect him to, really. So uh, something must be done in order that he should get 100% uh, of a average living. Now that, that's, uh, I'll make that brief because that's what I have to say. And I'm very much for the Brown Plan, and I feel that it would uh, uh, cure some of the ills, not all of them, but a few of the ills of the present program, which uh, uh, makes uh, for food destruction and surely there are starving people in this country as well as around the world who could use those foods that are being destroyed and uh, just rot. Yeah. I think that was very good. Very good. Very good. Right uh, the point. <coughs> you want me now to comment on, on these things? Yeah, just a wondering. We, well, we probably need to take yeah. another five minutes. Yeah. Maybe, uh, uh, how about Knox? Uh, this young fellow hasn't, hasn't said a word yet. I don't know. I Hey, you boys, want to say anything now? We just got about three, four minutes more, and then the senator's got to have five minutes to tell us what he thinks about the deal. We've got to go up to Thomas at 4.30, uh, Agricultural Committee. Uh, uh, she was talking about the perishable rotting away and the dumping and the putting on the shelf. Uh, we're scared that uh, eventually uh, the people that are providing the money to do that are going to react in a different direction. Might destroy even what we've got. Uh, they probably won't feel that uh, as they do now. They've been paying an insurance premium, Senator Gurney called it, to protect us from that. And they probably won't continue to do that when they don't get any benefits from it. They will com commence to think that they're not getting any when they see food rotting away in the caves of cans and potatoes. I don't know where they're going to dump them. You feel the consumer is paying twice and an increased price and then in taxes to support a program that destroys food. That's right. They might resent that. Farmers Union has never, never tolerated that, and we don't think that uh, other segments of society will very much long. It's bad as killing pigs. Uh, well, well, I think there would be some that had not spoke before the, the uh, other, Senator Gurney, maybe someone. Because we've only got a limited time. We uh, didn't get here around. Can we talk about the new fast? You want to say something here? You've got to move fast because we just have a few minutes. Mr. Keezer from Wesley Spring. Lord Keezer. Well, the Farmers Union isn't asking for special privileges. All the farmers want is a fair share of the national income. And what we can't figure out is if the farmer gets 60% and 75%, who gets the, who gets the, I mean, this farmer gets 60%, somebody getting 140%, that's what we do. All we want is a fair share of national income. That's good. I think, uh, I think we feel that the plan of the parity thing overshadows everything else. But just in passing, you might say that the farmer's union, as I understand, still is for the MBA program, and we're still advocating, and you don't need to labor this, because Senator Bunce is for us on the Farm Bureau divorcement. A hundred percent, and so are the whole, the whole delegation. Uh, and we're back in the REA on extension, on expansion of REA facilities in South Dakota to the limit. And whatever they're asking for, they've been down here in delegation. Unless, uh, I think that covers it all. We're against that 1008 on price discrimination. Yeah, exactly. And that just briefly uh, states the point, I guess. The rural road. Come all right, I'll do that then. Yeah, I believe it's 4.30? Yeah, that's right. One difficulty. <laughs> well, we did a lot better with our scheduling, I think, last year. We had about an hour, an hour and a half together, and we could really get into these problems, but... Uh, I guess we'll have to have even uh, well, you have, well, you just have three or four or five minutes to discuss uh, a problem as complicated as agriculture. You can't do justice to that to say nothing of getting off on all these other questions. So, in the little time we have, let's talk about the farm problem, because I think that's basic, the basic situation of parity, the situation of prices, that's basic... Not only to all our other problems on the farm, but it's basic to the whole national economy. And uh, 
Let me start out by saying that I very definitely believe that we should pass legislation at this session of Congress to improve our present farm bill. I voted for the Anderson bill because it repealed the Hope Aiken bill, which was a bill I voted against, which I thought was no good because it put a lower floor down as low as 65%. The Anderson bill should give us fairly decent protection for one year. But as Nemo pointed out, and as you pointed out, Lawrence, it isn't going to give us protection for the following year because it provides for a sliding scale downward. Now, I can't tell you whether they're going to bring any bill out this year or not, but you're going to go from me up to Mr. Thomas, Congressman, a senator from Oklahoma, who's chairman of the Agricultural Committee. He should be able to tell you, because he's chairman of the committee that has to bring out the bill, and he has a very strong majority of his party on that committee, and if the Democrats under Senator Thomas want to bring a bill out, they'll bring it out. All they need if they don't want to bring it out, or they won't bring it out. Now, I don't know what they're going to do. All they need is two Republicans to support, to, to get a majority, I think, on it. I don't know. I'm sure I don't That's belong to the committee, but at least uh, they've got enough of their own if they want to, and they certainly ought to get some Republican help. Yeah. I concur with that. Now, they didn't bring up the Brandon bill last time. Uh, the information I get is that they have no intention of bringing it up this time. I think it would be a fair question to ask uh, uh, Senator Thompson, because I don't think that any bill is going to do any good just staying in a committee. That isn't going to solve the farm problem. Just having a talking bill or just having a bill that uses political bait isn't going to be any good. You've got to have a bill that operates on the farm. And I think we need some changes, and we need them now. <coughs> Unfortunately, I think there's a little rivalry, uh, to use a good polite word, between Secretary Brannon and Chairman Thomas and former Secretary Anderson. Each of them has got a little different idea of the farm program, and they don't seem to be able to agree. <coughs> I suppose maybe there's a little pride of authorship there, but in all events, I'd like to see them bring out some kind of bill on the floor so we can begin getting some definite answers to the questions and begin writing in some amendments. In all events, I'm for a bill which will provide the farmer with an honest parity formula, pushing those parity prices as close to 100% as we can get them. I tried to support, and I did support. I spoke seven times on the floor while it was up in the Senate last year, urging that this 90% floor be made a permanent floor, that they couldn't put it down beyond that. And I thought we had a good foundation on which to build. And we got that through, it went through, and uh, with the aid of the vice president who voted for it when it was a tie vote, and they took it back to the committee and did a little uh, political horse trading or something. When they came back, they had us beat, and we, as you know, we didn't get that job done. Now, there's some problems in connection with the Brandon plan that we've got to face up to very frankly. And it's all a matter of money. Just as our problem on the farm is a matter of money. And the reason I think farm prosperity is so important is not only because of the farm, not only because of my personal selfish interest, because out in Lake County where I live, I farm two-quarter sections of land. And if I don't make money on my farm, you don't make it on yours and vice versa. So I'm interested in a farm program that will work and bring us decent prices for our products. The difficulty is we run into with the Brandon plan are number one, and I think I heard Senator Gurney talking about this, that we can't find out any definite figures that Secretary Brandon will give us that will say if you'll vote someone's money, we can guarantee the farmer 100% apparel. Now Congress just isn't going to appropriate what you call an open-end commitment that say that you can have anywhere from $5 billion to $50 billion to spend whatever it costs. Congress says, how much money do you want to finance the program? And he's got to give us a figure. Just the way you don't go down and buy an automobile with an open-end commitment. You don't walk into the automobile dealer and say, I'll take a car. <coughs> you ask him what I ask him, how much is it going to cost? Well, that's a legitimate question that you've got a right to ask. You've got a reason to know the taxpayers are going to insist upon it. Despite the fact it is serious, as Chan points out, you can't commit the next Congress, even though you vote it once. You might not get it the next time, but certainly we've got to have the amount in mind first in order to get the thing under operation. It's taken us about 25 years to get the American public to accept the theory and the principle that the farmer is entitled to a floor under his price. That was done back in 1900, the 38 or 39, and the Spiegel Bill. 38, I believe. 38. The Stiegel Amendments went through in 1938. I came down here in, in 39 and we voted for them every time, and during the war we had a pretty firm price bill. And that worked along until the Aiken Bill came along, and we began getting these uh, fluctuating price flowing now, and these sliding parity schemes, which are injurious, as I think, to the farm interest. But that's one thing we've got to answer, that we've got to know about, because if we take that price flow away, as Mr. Brannon proposed, your prices are going to get whatever the market level suggests. It's going to be a pretty low level. It may be lower than in Hoover's day as far as that's concerned, which wouldn't make any difference 
if you can get enough money from Congress to send you a check to make up the difference. But if you get only half enough money from Congress to make up the difference, then we're in pretty serious shape on our South Dakota farm. That's why it's important. We know how much money is required. And if we can get Congress to appropriate that much money, then we can operate at least for a year with some assurance that farmers isn't going to get gypped. But we don't want to above everything else, in my opinion, just to let the prices fall unless we're sure we're going to have enough money coming back to pay for it. Now, parity is a, is a kind of a tricky formula. Now, let me illustrate that. Under the Brandon program, they say we'll give you 100% of parity for wheat. But 100% of parity for wheat under Mr. Brandon's proposal is less than 90% of parity for wheat under the present bill. So parity, as the lady points out, it depends on what you put in. It's like the recipe for a cake. You get a different kind of cake if you have a different kind of recipe. And I want to see an honest parity formula developed that a man can understand on the farm that we can do business with. I don't see why. 90% of one guy's parity should be more than 100% of the next man's parity, but that is actually what it is today. And so we do need a price floor. We need it as high as 100% as we can possibly get it. We need it with some kind of legislative background or assurance that it goes on next year and year after that and year after that so you don't have a different set of rules every time you start the game when you break up the fields in the morning. Now, if Mr. Brannon can work out those kind of specific replies and it can be shown to work and he can give us a guarantee of some kind that the farmer isn't simply going to get parity or close to parity for a year and then next year, let the people in the cities and the big areas get cheap foodstuffs while the farmer cuts his stuff down because he doesn't get money enough, then I'm interested in it. But I'm interested in a program which isn't going to ever again let price is fall as we had him back in the Depression period. I'm not married to any program. Uh, any program that helps you helps me selfishly and individually on my part. And no program that uh, doesn't help me is, can possibly be of assistance to you. I think we should include more of the products that we have uh, in South Dakota. And the one thing I don't like about Mr. Brannon's proposal is that uh, it doesn't touch any of our small grains. Uh, I don't know if any of you fellows raise small grains, but I raise some barley, I raise some oats, I raise some rye. None of that stuff is protected at all. I think you've got to have some kind of price flow under that. There's sure us, because that's important in a diversified farm. And on a family-sized farm, it's the kind of farm I believe in. Uh, you've got to have, I believe, diversified farm. cotton and a slot machine kind of farming. If you hit, you get the jackpot. If you don't, well, you borrow money and try to get it next year. But on a diversified farm, you've got to have a fairly decent price for eggs and for butter. Now, there's no protection for butter under the, under the brand and patent. It protects milk. But we're not in a fluid milk shed. We get our profits, or at least I do on my farm mostly, from the milking business from the standpoint I want to get for the butter fat. That's the essential thing. And I want to see a program worked out uh, by Brandon or by Thomas, or by Anderson, or the three of them get together, or Republicans and Democrats should work together, as many politics and farming as I see it, it's an economic problem, it gives us a price floor, as close to parity as we can get it, under as many of the products as you can reasonably expect to support on a family-sized farm, which has some assurance that it goes on year after year so that you don't have to start out with any set of rules every time you start farming. And that's my theory, that's my program. And I'm eager that we do something this year. Uh, certainly, I'll do everything I can to talk to the Republican members of the Agricultural Committee to influence them to vote to bring up a bill that will improve the present bill. And by improving it, that means giving us a better passport. And if Mr. Bannon will come up and answer these questions, which every one of you would ask if you were going to build a house, you'd ask how much is it going to cost for the lumber, uh, which Congress has to ask. Mr. Bannon, all right, you got a new theory? How much money do you want? And he can't just come up and say, I don't know. Because if he means business, if he's trying to sell us a farm program, as I give him credit for doing, being sincere, that's something you've got to sit down and figure out. <coughs> to start with. The Senator, I'm yeah. sorry that our time is so limited. We, uh, we just overlooked one thing. I take it you're for the family-type farm provision. You think that's pretty good deal in the Brandon plan, don't you? Well, the they have it now with the, with the units. Yeah. I'm not for one that puts acres up, but for units, that that's makes right. sense. That's right. That'll overcome the yeah. problem of acres. Yeah. That's one great forward step, and I think that's one of the best things there is in the Brandon plan. Now, I'm sorry. Well, let me say there's another good point about the Brandon plan that I like. Because we so short a time, I can't no. talk about it. Uh, Mr. Brandon, in his theory and his plan, aims at solving one of the big problems that you talked about, how to get rid of the surplus. That's right. Now, I'm for getting rid of the surplus. I don't want to get rid of them on the basis that the farmer's going to take it in the neck getting rid of it. I want to get rid of them on a 
basis somehow so that the farmer gets a decent price for the products that he raises. And I don't see as yet, because Granon has refused to answer the question, how he's going to get the farmer a decent price for these surpluses. Unless he can get Congress to appropriate the money, which he knows, and I know, and you know he isn't going to get till he tells Congress how much money he wants. That's the first question that's got to be answered before you can even take the plan out of the theory of a dream and make it a formula. And, and uh, we've got to get the farmer protected on it. It isn't any fun for us to say, well, of course you can get care of the shop, but just give the food away. And you're, take care of the farm. You're for uh, giving every encouragement and support to the expansion of REA in Certainly. South Dakota. Certainly. The REA's Certainly. been down here met with. They've been down here met. And by the way, I wish you'd talk to Thomas about this. We were, we were about to get it over the we we talk with East River or West River people, but if he's the East River people mostly, we just about had this REA thing lifted. We were all down here. We had a meeting and met with the South Dakota delegation and met with the REA and met with the Bureau. They had worked out a system, a transmission line, everything good. And then Mr. Thomas, Senator Thomas introduced a bill which says that before you can build any transmission lines, you've got to get an act passed by Congress each time, which I'm against. I don't think that makes sense. That's who do you suppose, love building. Who do you suppose uh, the inspiration of that private power company? I wouldn't have any idea. I don't know. Uh, Except I know this, that Grant uh, Thomas is a strong administration senator. He's the man picked out to introduce the Grant Bill. Yes, he's wonderful. He's, he's, the he's for full parity. So the, there's a fellow, you see, that says that we look at it, he's sort of speaking for the administration. He sticks this in. I don't blame poor Mr. Wickard down there. He can't move till this bill is either voted out or voted down or something done because that bill might pass. Uh, no, I don't think it'll pass. <laughs> but I think it will block any action down there, Evo, until the thing is brought out and defeated. That's the point. We're going to fight that yeah. bill just as hard as if Senator Gurney introduced yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think it's going to pass, but it's a roadblock just the same. And I want to give it to the roadblock. And, and you're for the army angle. You're for divorce. <clears throat> divorce in the private organization, farm organization, besides states. One hundred percent. Thank you. Really. meeting.
We have just concluded a meeting here at the Dodge Hotel, hearing a discussion on the Brannan Farm Program by our representatives in Washington, and we tend to interview some of these people as they pass on. We have here somebody that's been speaking this evening. I want to introduce to you. Uh, this is Milton Holton with the North Dakota Farmers Union. Uh, what would you like to have me say? Oh, we wonder what you're doing up in North Dakota. Rather, we, we know now. Well, we're going to go up on the hill tomorrow and see if we can talk to a few congressmen about some of the farm legislation that we need. Yes, thank you. Thank you. My name is, my name is Angus McDonald. I'm assistant legislative representative here in Washington, representing the Farmers Union, appearing on bills we're interested in. We've been seeing a lot of farmers, though, lately. Uh, we don't see so many, usually. People from South Dakota, people from Tripp County, people from all over have been coming in here, farmers talking to their congressmen, to their senators and representatives about the Brannan plan, about the power issue, about uh, the monopoly bill, about the Farm Bureau extension bills and other bills that the Farmers Union people are interested in. And let me tell you folks back there in Tripp County that they're doing a good job up here influencing national legislation. Thank you. Uh, I think you remember the days when we had to fight about rural electrification. And if there's any state in the union that ought to be doing something about REA, it's right out in your own home state. Uh, the state, the other states have as many as 80 to 90 percent of the farms electrified. Dakota, you have about 30 uh, percent. Isn't that about right now? You surely need the development of public power. You're going to get that under the Missouri the River Development. I happen to be for an MBA. Uh, I think I'm... You know, I wish that while you're down here, you can have more farmers than any other and all other organizations put together. Isn't that right? Now, you're the people that are going to be involved in the Missouri Valley development. And yet, you're Congress. And in South Dakota, that's the greater section of the NBA. That's the one area that's going to be fundamentally affected. And yet, your Congress hasn't listened to your words one bit. I mean, they've gone ahead with the Pix Loan Plan, which you folks have never endorsed, which you know is not a good plan. And the Missouri Valley Authority is a plan that you had wanted, that you've studied. And God, I don't know anybody that knows anything more about what goes on in Dakota than the people that live there. I sure don't know there isn't anybody down here that knows anything about what goes on out there. I live through the grasshoppers, and I live through the dust storms and the depression and the drought. I know what goes on out there. I was 28 years old before I left the state of South Dakota. My family played 50 years out there in business. And yet the Congress of the United States, without regard to the wishes of the people, and you know just as well as I do that the most popular issue in Dakota is an MBA. The only people that are for the Missouri Valley Development Pix Loan Plan are the utilities and a couple of Republican governors. And one, <laughs> and one Republican governor, Mr. Sharp, ran out of So they dumped him. They have a way of taking care of him. I don't want to talk any party politics to you in particular, but once in a while you've got to speak the truth. And the fact of the matter is, on this situation, that the MBA is the program of the people out of that state, and yet you're denied having it. Now, when you get home and meet some of these economizers, and you're going to meet a lot of them, you just tell them that the most expensive development of the Missouri Valley, without fear of contradiction, is the plan that they're in right now. Even the Hoover Commission says that this is the most expensive development. The Missouri Valley Authority, an integrated type of development, would save millions of dollars of the people's taxpayer, of the people's money, and give you much more in direct results than what you're going to get. But be that as it may, MV, the Missouri Valley development is better than nothing. It's better than what we had, so if you can't get MBA, we'll have to coast along with this for a while until we get enough people around here that understand what the people want. Now, I, th I feel very strong on the subject of Missouri Valley Authority because I was born in the state with a dust storm going right over my head at the time I was born, I'm sure. I know what it means to not have water out in South Dakota. They talk about a shortage of water in New York. They don't know what it is to be without water. Man, oh man, how many of you people remember 1931 and 32? How many of you remember when Jim River dried up and Lake Byron dried up? You remember that? There wasn't any water any place. Yet they talk about a water shortage out here in the East. They don't know what a water shortage means. <laughs>